Hey everyone, welcome to week two, and we're gonna dive into unexpected issues and super excited to talk with you in this Fight for the House series. So I wanna start with a story. I actually have to admit something. I have a minivan. I'm one of those guys who have a minivan. I actually love our minivan, ton of space, so practical. But we had just gotten our minivan. This was a few years ago and we were on vacation. We were coming back from our first half of vacation going through Eastern Colorado and we ran into a hailstorm. We were in the middle of nowhere. There were no bridges, there was no anything to get under. And you're kind of torn between, do I go slowly and try to drive out of the storm? Or do I just sit on the side of the road and get pounded with hail? Well, we did a little of each, but it totally damaged our van. And we had to, we were going then back east, we had to stop in Lincoln, take care of, you know, get estimates and insurance things and all that kind of stuff. And, and it really put a damper on on our vacation. Um, but but here's the, the point of that. The point is simply unexpected issues arise. And they did on our vacation, they do when hailstorms come, they, they do in all kinds of ways. In fact, some a lot of times I bet you you've gone and had have had unexpected issues arise as well. Maybe financial, where you're like, we had this financial plan, but then these things happened, and now that financial plan got blown out of the water, right? Or, or man, things with our kids, or things with family and relationships. I mean, all of those unexpected issues arise, and that's the reality of the situation. Well, what we're talking about today in Jude, we see right away in the beginning of Jude. Jude actually needed to address an unexpected issue. He was actually gonna write this group of people about salvation, he was gonna write to them about salvation or this incredible um, gift that we have and, and what Jesus did for us. And that was his, totally his intent. But then he got word of some of the things that were going on there and he said, I was gonna write about this, but now I clearly need to write about that. And I think it can be difficult, unexpected issues, because we may not have a plan. We don't know what we're supposed to do with them. We don't know maybe how to address them. And so I think what's hard about unexpected issues is that they're unexpected. But what we're gonna do is dive into Jude here and see how he addressed the unexpected issues of his day. Um, and he was facing spiritual um, unexpected issues. And so, um, we're gonna look at how to face unexpected issues and specifically looking at Jude and the spiritual um, issues that he was facing. So the first way that we're gonna address unexpected issues is one, by simply identify twisted truths. That's what Jude was doing. He needed to identify twisted truths and said, in fact, verse four says, some ungodly men have wormed their way into the churches. And that literally means they kind of slid in or slipped in unnoticed or unannounced. And, and what was happening in verse three, then Jude said, he's urging the people to defend the faith. And so one of the questions with, with twisted truths and how to address unexpected issues, this idea of defending the faith. Now, what does that mean to defend the faith? Like to, to fight and to, to wrestle and to, to argue with people about our faith? Typically not, <laughs> but uh, simply the best way to defend our faith is to know the truth. And knowing the truth will help us identify those twisted truths that may come at us. So the best biblical definition uh, or the best way to know the truth of scripture is to know the gospel. And the gospel simply means good news. And one of the the clearest presentations of the gospel that I've seen in all of scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses one through eight, and it says this. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I have told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place, that twisted truth. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James, later by all the apostles, last of all, as though I had been born out of the wrong time, I also saw him. So here, 
the Apostle Paul is just giving us a clear picture of the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's it's the story of, of Jesus and his life in ministry, passion, death, and resurrection, and how he appeared to, to the people of that day. So that's a really good example of the gospel in scripture. There's also a great historical um, example of the gospel in scripture. And it's the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed are both very good things. And, and here's the thing, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed were addressing um, twisted truths of their day. So they, to, they sat down and said, okay, what is at the core of what we believe in the Christian faith? And here's what the Nicene Creed says. It says, I believe in one God, the Almighty Father, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things are made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the, on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with whom the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Just the clarity of the truth of scripture from 1 Corinthians and then from uh, the Nicene Creed. So here's the thing, we need to know the truth in order to identify twisted truths. In fact, the FBI, when they train people in how to identify counterfeit money, they don't look at all the counterfeit money. They actually um, help those FBI agents learn what real money looks like so well that if anything doesn't look like that, it's counterfeit. And the same is true for the gospel truth. We need to know the truth so well and have it so personalized and, and so clear that we're able to recognize those twisted truths because the best twisted truth is just a, almost like a full truth with a slight twist. And that's still a lie. And so we need to make sure that we know the gospel super well to identify those. And so a couple other definitions I think we should be familiar with when we're looking at identifying twisted truths. And one is a Christian or biblical worldview. I'm using those terms synonymously. And a Christian or biblical worldview just refers to the framework of ideas and beliefs through which a Christian individual or group or culture interprets the world. So it's kind of that lens by which we see the world. Um, and that's super important. We can see the world through the eyes of truth of scripture instead of through our own feelings and interpretations. A lot of times we approach the world and scripture with our experiences and our interpretations and our feelings, and we all come to it with that, but we need to make sure we allow scripture to create the lens by which we see everything. And that's an important distinction. The other definition that I think would be good to, to work through is uh, the discipline of apologetics. Apologetics is just simply the intellectual defense of biblical truth or the defense of the divine origin or authority of Christianity. And early Christian writers who defended Christian beliefs like Jude, Jude would have been referred to as a Christian apologist. And that's actually what he's doing in here. And so those are good terms for us to wrestle with as well. So one, we need to identify twisted truths. Two, we need to realize the false teachings from within. See, the dangers that Jude is referring to here is not from outside the church. They're not from people who aren't followers of Jesus that are trying to, you know, attack the church or bring false teachings into the church. The issues that he's facing and the false teachings are actually coming from within. Um, we're not surprised when people from outside don't do Christian things, right? Or don't believe um, biblical truths. But it's a totally different thing when those who proclaim to be Christians aren't believing or they're the ones twisting the truth. It's kind of like friendly fire. It's a very different thing. And so Jesus um, 
always addresses this. In fact, all throughout scripture, um, Old Testament, New Testament, this is not anything new. Jesus addresses this. And the Bible warns us about false teachers and false teachings. And so this isn't anything new that Jude was facing. And it's not anything new that we're facing today. And so we shouldn't be surprised by it. We shouldn't feel like we shouldn't have to wrestle through it or that something else is causing it. That's just been a common way by which the enemy has tried to throw or diminish the church. And so I think that's super important. So, and here's the thing, we're not just talking about doctrinal differences here when we're looking at twisted truths and, and all that. We're actually, and these teachings, these false teachings are coming from within, we're looking at like core Christian beliefs that they were twisting and getting wrong. And that's what we want to make sure that we're familiar with, know ourselves that it's so personalized that we understand it and can identify when it's not happening. So we want to make sure we identify twisted truths. We want to make sure that we um, can, can realize the false teachings and the fact that they come from within. And then the last thing is, is speaking the truth in love. And, and here's the, the reality of it, you guys, however we communicate or how we communicate the truth matters. That's like the most important thing. Um, this is where the power of truth and God's love for people, this is where they meet, speaking the truth in love. Love never keeps us from sharing the truth. Love should never keep us from that. Um, it's simply the avenue by which the truth is shared. So love and truth aren't at all on opposite ends of any spectrum. The truth is the truth no matter what, and love is the vehicle by which it's communicated. And so this means timing, language, uh, the motivation of our own hearts, and when we communicate it, how we receive it, all of that matters. This we, means we need to care more about the person than the issue. Uh, people are more important than the issue, and so how we do that matters. However, love never cancels out the truth. Love should never hinder or slow down the truth, but it should put it together. It should be the correct vehicle by which it's communicated. And here's, here's the reality about some of these things. We're all on this continuum of our enjoyment of tension and hard conversations. Some of us love tension. We're like, yeah, let's get into it. Let's hash it through. Let's get to the truth, get to the bottom of the issue. And some of us are like, I don't want to talk about anything that might be hard or difficult with other people. And maybe most of us fall somewhere in between. But part of discipling others is having hard conversations. So although they may be really difficult, some of you may be way too excited for them and some of you may want nothing to do with them. It is a part of discipling in ourselves, our own discipleship journey and in the journey of other people. And so don't back away from hard conversations, but ask God for wisdom. There's really two sides to every conversation, isn't there? In, in these in these hard conversations, sometimes it's I'm on one side sharing God's truth and I need to do it in love. Sometimes I'm on the receiving side and I need to hear the truth in love. And so uh, I think it's important for us to identify both sides and we've all been on both sides before. But when we participate in these hard conversations, we need to do it with love and humility. We need to do it with grace and peace. We need to make sure that we've looked inward in our own selves and how we're going to do it and that that's really clear. And when that happens, here's the cool thing. The church gets healthier and the kingdom of God advances. And I think as Christ followers, that's what we're all about. And so it's worth it to have hard conversations. Don't back away. Push yourself into them. If you're too excited about it, calm yourself into them. And, and let's make sure that we're giving and receiving truth in love for one another. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you for the grace and peace and love and, and the reality that you show us how to communicate in hard conversations in your word. And I just ask that as we, as we go into our conversations today, Jesus, would we do it with truth and in love? And would we be able to hear and speak that truth um, for each one of us? And Lord, help us by your Holy Spirit to make that happen. In Jesus' name, amen. Enjoy your conversations.